Father, we come to you this morning. Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, your love, your compassion. Father, I ask that as we open your word this morning, you would give us eyes to see, that your Holy Spirit would unveil Christ to us. Father, in a way we've never seen him before that will not only revolutionize our lives, but transform them from the inside out. That we may understand and know all that Christ did on the cross, what he ended and what he raised us to. So open our eyes as we get into your word this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. This morning, you got your Bibles. Let's start. I'm going to try to start at John 14. We'll see what happens. We'll get there right away. John chapter 14. I had a thought this week that I want to open up with and just try to imagine with me what, what a day would look like, honestly, what a day would look like if we would completely walk in the Spirit. Now, I don't know, you know, I think Jesus was really the only one that could get away with this. I don't know why, and you, you're going to have to, I don't have the answers. But I'm going to give you a bunch of stuff today that's going to provoke you to go to the Father for your own answers because this is something that cannot be mandated. Okay, so there's no rules today, there's no laws, there's no principles, there's no keys. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit. So the thought that came to me today, or not today, but this week that I want to share with you today, is what would happen on your next day off, and I mean can't be on a work day because you got things to do. But on your day off, so you're going to take a day off. What would happen, and could you even function this way? Because this is the way Jesus functioned, and it's nothing, anything like the way you and, and I function on a day-to-day -day basis. But let's say tomorrow morning's your day off. All right, and you wake up, but you don't wake up because there's an alarm clock. You don't have an alarm clock. In fact. When you wake up, what's the first, I know the first thing that I do when I wake up is I look at the time. Because that's going to that's gonna dictate something to me. Right. Time is going to tell me whether I should get up or stay in bed, how much more time I have, what have you. So let's say there's no alarm clock, and you're not going to look at the clock. You're simply going to wake up and go, hmm, Lord, should I get up? Should I go back to sleep? What's happening here? And maybe you go back to sleep for another hour. But then you wake up and you're not looking at that clock again. You have no, it could be 1 o'clock in the afternoon. It could be 7 o'clock in the morning. You really can't tell. It's daylight, but you really can't tell. But you're just laying there waiting to hear the Father. You're waiting for inspiration to get up, what have you. And let's say that happens. Finally, you're like, okay, we're, we're going to get up. I feel like it's time to get up. And you get your coffee or whatever, but you don't, you're still not looking at time. You're not looking at a to-do list. It's your day off. So all tasks to-do lists, all that you put aside. So then you got to put aside, I'm not going to answer the phone. I'm not going to look at the phone. No one's going to pressure me to do this, do that. I'm shutting down, and it's going to be at the Father, and I'm going to only do what I sense or hear him say to do. And I don't know what that day would look like, to be honest with you. Because I can't, I, I, everything I do is based on this time. Well, it's one o'clock, you know, or my to-do list. You take away this watch and my to-do list, tasks that I need to do, the daily grind or what have you, I don't know if I could function. I think we would all just sit in front of the TV and wait for something to happen. I'll just watch TV and binge on something. Right. So, so I was... 
I kind of did this Saturday. I, I woke up and I'm like, you know, I know what I would normally do. Saturday, I usually, you know, get my coffee, go downstairs and um, work on my sermon some more and try to hear the Lord. And But I woke up and I thought, no, nah, I'm going to lay here and see what happens. Well, you know what happened. I went back to sleep. Yeah. So I woke up and I'm like, okay. So I felt inspired to get up. And finally, I looked at the clock, you know, couldn't, I was tempted to do that. I did that. But... Um, I didn't get very far within the day before the tasks started coming. That's it. And, um, but I thought, as I thought, I thought, okay, you know, this is difficult. This is, this is not, it's easier, way easier said than done. But I challenge you to do it. I don't, this is not, just, just try it. On a day off where you, there's nothing pending, this, that, or the other. Now. If you could successfully do that one day, and I'm going to tell you, not going to be easy because if you if you could not look at the clock and you could not look at the task, the to-do list, I guarantee you the kids are going to call, or if you've got kids in the house, they're going to pull on you, and someone's. I'm telling you, I'm not lying. This has been one crazy week that I couldn't even get to my to-do list. To do's of other things came through the phone, knocking on the door, people in the house. I couldn't even get to my to do list. There was a they to do list. Yeah. Then there's a to do. And it's like, wow. And so I was behind the eight ball. I had to cancel some meetings this week to get in with some people. I was behind the eight ball every day. Every day. And um, we had a midweek service in Clarksburg. And uh, Every time I'd go to sit down and work on my outline or work on my notes, there's the phone, there's this, there's that, or this didn't work, the internet went down, the, the laptop was frozen. I mean, you couldn't believe, and I'm thinking, really, how in the world can someone put all that aside and do what Jesus did? Because Jesus said, I only do what I see my Father doing, and this is why he had to get away from everybody to go up to the mountain. That was his only escape from all the daily grind and the hustle and bustle was to break away from even his own 12 and go up on the mountain and sit at the feet of his father and hear him, see what he was doing. Then when he came back, he wasn't going to be led by anybody or be told by anybody. Actually, I, I lied to you. I even said, I, if I get to John 14, something occurs to me. Let's go to the scripture, Isaiah 11. This is a scripture you rarely hear. And we just say, well, only Jesus can do this. And, and I agree, only Jesus can do this. It's only prophesied for Jesus to do this. However, where is Jesus today doing it? Within us. Yes. Amen. Within us. And, and so we just can't say, well, that was Jesus up there. Again, this is going to be one of those days where I'm, the scriptures are going to come and I don't know exactly where they are. I mean, I ballpark them. But it, Isaiah chapter 11. It talks about the rod, verse 1, that comes from the stem of Jesse. That's Jesus. The branch shall grow out of, his, out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. This is Isaiah prophesying about Jesus. He says, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. So Jesus is going to have the spirit of wisdom resting on him and the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel and the spirit of power or might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, reverence for his father. Verse 3, his delight will be in the fear of the Lord, reverence, and he shall not, now here's what I want you to see, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes. That means Jesus is going to look at something and he's not going to make a judgment by what he sees. Now, keep that in mind. Nor decide by the hearing of his ears. This talks about that the Spirit of the Lord on him is going to override his five senses. 
So he's not going to wake up in the morning and his eyes go, oh, i got to cut the grass. He's not going to wake up in the morning and whatever he hears, oh, I hear this, so I'm going to do that. He's not going to make a judgment by what he sees. He's not going to make a decision by what he hears. Well, how in the world does one operate outside of his five senses? What, what are the five senses? Sight, right? Hearing. What? Hearing. Hearing. Taste. What? Taste. Tasting. What else? Smell. Huh? Smell. 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 And touch. And touch. We are led by all five senses. Now the key is, out of these five senses, did we educate these five senses by our culture, yeah. by family, education, TV, media, all that. Sight, hearing, all these, we, we, we function by learning from this. So what, my, what, my, what I see my culture doing, what I hear my family saying, Tasting is not, tasting is actually, if I get to tasting, it's really funny, the story down the road. Smell or touch is, is all determined by how we're raised. Jesus comes, and what Isaiah is prophesying, because the Spirit of the Lord is on him, he's not going to take his cue, his five senses, from these. Amen. Jesus is going to take his cue from the Spirit which is the Father, resting on Him. So here, we go this way with our five senses. Jesus goes this way with the five senses. You see that in Isaiah 11. Now, if Christ operated this way, He's not going to go by what TV says, what preachers say, what church says, what family, education, professor, school. I'm not going to filter my five senses through this, but through the Spirit. So the Spirit is controlling His five senses, these five senses become the servant of the spirit that's on him, whereas these five things are the servant of what these things tell us what to believe and do. Right? I mean, every day we hear, I mean, with the, and basically what I want to focus mostly on, because this is where we both sight and sound. So I turn the TV on and I hear somebody say something and, I'm, and, and, I, and I make a decision based on what I'm hearing that person say through the TV. Or I see something happen, I'm like, oh, I see what you did. And I make a judgment by what I see that person do. Right. But Jesus said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see the same things you see. And I'm going to hear the same kind of stuff you're hearing. But I'm going to turn to the Father, the Spirit, and hear what He has to say. Not what I'm because I'm not going to judge by what these outward things are. I'm going to judge by the... So basically, his focus, Jesus is on the inner, not the outer. Amen. So, five senses. See that there? Yeah. So, but, but with righteousness, verse 4, but with righteousness he shall judge and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth and on and on it goes. But there's what I want you to see that. Now go to... Um, Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Now in verse 10 he's talking about Melchizedek. But he says, and, and what and, and just get real quickly, Melchizedek is a priest that Abraham gave his tithes to. And so basically Melchizedek is a type of the priesthood of Jesus, whereas Levites were in the genes of Abraham. They're the earthly priesthood is the Levites. They haven't came about yet. They don't come until Moses comes along with the Ten Commandments, but they're in Abraham. But Melchizedek is a different type of priesthood. So you got one priesthood subservient to another priesthood. All right, showing that Melchizedek is a greater priesthood and, he, and Jesus, and he speaks of the priesthood of Jesus, who's going to be the high priest over the new covenant, whereas the Levites were the high priest over the old covenant. Okay, I, that's the you know that's old teaching on new covenant, old covenant. But I want you to see 
He wants to talk to them about how Jesus is over the new covenant and everybody else was under the old covenant. But look what he says here in verse 11. Well, let's look at verse 10. He's called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, talking about Jesus. High priest after the order of Melchizedek. Look at verse 11. Of whom we have much to say. So Paul says, i got a lot of things to say to you about Melchizedek, but hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, and if you were, I could teach you about Melchizedek, but he says you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk, not solid food. So because you are still milk-oriented, I can't talk to you about the, the spiritual things of the new covenant because you only know about the oracles and principles, the elementary things of the old covenant. Verse 13, For everyone who partakes only of milk, and that's babes in Christ who have not, they could be 30 years old in the Lord, but they've never grown in theology or their understanding of Scripture. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. So, there, so what he's saying is, if you are a leader in the church, or you're pastoring, or whatever it is that you're doing, he says if you are on milk, you'll be unskilled in the word of righteousness, which that's what the new covenant is. The new covenant is the word of righteousness. Righteousness is a gift. Now, that's not where I'm going. I'm just showing you the context of the scripture. But solid food, so the difference is between milk, and if, you, if you're a milk Christian, you, have, you are unskilled in the word of righteousness. You're unskilled in the new covenant. Right. But if you're milk... You'd be skilled in the old covenant. But look what he says in verse 1. Solid food belongs to those who are of full age. So spiritual maturity can only come by those under the new covenant growing in that. Where they don't need the milk anymore of the elementary principles of the world. They're into solid food. They're getting spiritual revelation of the new covenant of Christ and the cross and what he did. He said, now here's what I want you to do. But solid food belongs to those who are full of age, mature. That is... Those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So, there is something that we do to these five senses, exercise them. In the word of righteousness, that's what it says, that's the only way to exercise these senses is through the new covenant. And who is the minister to who is the personal minister to you through the new covenant? Christ. And Christ comes to us by way of Spirit. the Holy Spirit. Resting on us as it rested on Jesus. Okay? So you got the five senses here working on the Spirit, working from the Spirit. And you've got our five senses, which is over here, and they're being exercised by the word of righteousness, which is the new covenant, by the Holy Spirit. So it's the same thing in Isaiah 11. Jesus is only going to, he's not going to go by what he sees or hears. He's going to go by what the Spirit, the Father, the Spirit on him, is going to discern. And there's another word. He is going to discern things by the Holy Spirit, not by what... This dictates to your five senses to understand. Make sense? Yeah. Now let's get back to that original waking up. So you're going to wake up in the morning. You're going to put the clock away. You know, you're going to put the to-do list to do. All that you're going to put away. And now what's going to happen is these five senses, and you know you can also include your mind because that's, that's all. None of these are separate. They're meshed together. The mind, emotions, and will. You have to throw that in there too because these operate out of the mind. I mean, you smell something and, you, and it can affect your emotions. Why do you think they sell perfume and cologne? You ever smell perfume on a woman, a really good looking woman, and she walks by you and you smell her and you're like, oh God, wow, whoa. I mean, that, 
that smell affected my emotions. And my mind will remember that smell so I can feel, that's your touch, or sense, smell, whatever. See how these work together, right? Right. All right, so you know that. Now, you wake up in the morning, and you're going to put the clock away. You're going to, sit, you're going to do it. I'm, I'm going to try to hear the Father. No, no clock, no to-do list. I'm going to pull, try to pull this thing off. All right? So what ends up happening is all of a sudden your sight's going to start looking at things. Well, I got to do that. Well, when I get to get, you know, this happens when you pray. How many have tried to pray and your mind goes, "Oh, I got to mow the grass," yes, yeah. and all of a sudden the, the to-do list yeah. just come. I mean, it doesn't come on me when I'm watching TV. Sorry, it rarely comes. It's when I'm praying that all of a sudden the devil says, "Hey," he 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 puts the to-do list in my face, and then all of a sudden I start hearing something. I'm trying to pray and a dog's barking. You know, all of a sudden my hearing. When I'm praying, my sight is 2020. My hearing is like the bionic man. I can hear everything and anything, you know. And then I get hungry because I'm smelling something and I can taste what I'm smelling. And, you know, all of a sudden you're getting worked over by your own five senses. We are so controlled. And what, is the, what, what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? What does it mean when Paul said in Ephesians, don't get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean, be filled with the Holy Spirit? It means to come under the control. That's the Greek. I don't know why they use the word filled. But you could easily say, don't get... Because what happens when someone's under the, uh, drinking alcohol? They come under the influence of that alcohol. They start acting totally different than what they would had they not been drinking that alcohol, right? right yeah. Some drunks are mean. Well, I don't like it when he drinks. Why? He gets mean. He Because he's not normally mean until he starts drinking. And some wives, like, I love it with my... Because he's just so lovey-dovey when he drinks. He's just so, you know, whatever. He's funny when he drinks. and But he's not that way normally. What happens to a guy who drinks and gets mad or a guy who drinks and gets um, happy... He's being controlled by something other than himself. It's an outward chemical controlling him. So when Paul, Paul understood that, Paul knew what drunkenness was. He wasn't an idiot. He says, look, you know, let me teach you something. I'm going to use drunkenness as a contrast to coming under the control and the influence of the Holy Spirit. That's what all I'm saying. Wake up in the morning and rather let the time control you or your to-do list control you, or everything out there bombarding you, how about coming under the influence or the control of the Holy Spirit, like Jesus did, and walk and work out of that? Now go to Galatians 5. I'm going to show you this. This is not something that can be taught. All I can show you is that this is a reality and this is life. Reality and life. And you have to work these things out. There, you know, all, all a book can do is encourage you in this, but it can't, it can't do it for you. And it can't, you have to learn this. Like, I, I can't walk for a baby. They have to learn how to walk. That we can talk about walking, all, you know, get up, walk, you can tell them all day long, but they have to actually do it themselves. Now, in Galatians chapter 5, I, years ago in the early 90s, late 80s, I struggled with this verse. Shouldn't have because I, I was under people that should have known what this verse meant. I was too naive and young in the Lord to know it all, to know it. And I even went to the Lord and said, God, I don't understand this. Chapter 5. Look at verse um, 16. Paul says... Walk in the Spirit, and automatically by walking in the Spirit, something else happens. What? You don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So how do I not fulfill the lust of the flesh? Walk in the Spirit. I'm not even going to give you a to-do list. How many churches give you a to-do list how not to walk in this flesh? They all have rules. They get the rule book out when it comes to walking in the flesh. 
But he, you don't need a rule book. It clearly says that if I walk in the Spirit, automatically, not even me battling the flesh or trying to, I automatically am not walking in the flesh if I'm walking in the Spirit. Does that make sense? Now jump down to verse, same chapter, and look at, this is the verse I asked the Lord about, verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And I'm like, all right, how, how is that? Now, I know what I was taught, but what, how they presented it wasn't computing. So I'm sitting there thinking, how do I, if I live in the Spirit, wouldn't I automatically walk in the Spirit? And for years, um, like I said, 80s and early, really early, early 90s, because it was like the mid-90s when this made sense, finally. But I said, I, I, I just don't know. And then I thought, am I even walking in the Spirit? How much do I walk in the Spirit? How, have you ever asked yourself, I wonder how much I really walk in the Spirit? How many, anybody ever? Yeah. I do. Maybe I'm the only one. I do. But it tells me in verse, same chapter, look at verse 22. Here's how you'll know if you're walking in the Spirit. Because you'll have fruit. Here's the fruit. Love, joy, Peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And against such things, there's no rule book. So I can't, and, have, and, and I don't know why the church doesn't get this. He says, against such things there is no law, meaning that I can't show you how to love. There's no rule book on love, joy, peace. Amen. And yet the church is always telling you how to get these things. He says, there's no rules. There's no to do how to get. These things come from whether you're walking in the Spirit or not. You can't use willpower to produce love, joy, and peace. Self can't produce those. And when they do, they're just dead works. Amen. Now, how do I know when I'm walking in the Spirit? He says, this is the kind of stuff that will come out of you. And I look at that list sometimes and think, geez, man, I'm just not producing that. <laughs> well, then what are you producing? Well, let's see what he says when you're walking in the flesh. Jump up to verse 21 or uh, 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Adultery. Well, I don't commit it. He says if you look upon a woman, what happens? If you look upon a woman with lust, that is not the spirit. Now right there ought to tell you when you see a woman, you're like, wow, okay. That ought to tell you that's not the spirit. That's my flesh. All right, so right off the bat, you know you're on the wrong path of walking. I'm in the flesh. So that should be a sign to run and say, Holy Spirit, I look to you now. I, obviously, I'm in the flesh or I would not have gone this route of thinking. Uh, this isn't legalism because there's no rules here. This is why I said I'm not going to tell you how to do that. All I can tell you is the Spirit is available in you to produce the life of Christ. Now watch. What else? Fornicate... Um, are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred. Gotta hate that guy. Contentions, jealousies, jealousies, outbursts of anger. That's me, twenty, almost twenty-four-seven. I get mad about everything. So that should tell me that's flesh. All right, what else? Here's one, ambition. I want to make more money. I want a promotion at my job. I want to go higher up. That's all ambition. And we're taught that's good. I'm Look, someone in the flesh is always looking for opportunities. Someone in the spirit is looking for what God is doing. And it may not be, so if somebody in the spirit sees an opportunity, he doesn't just take it. He says, Lord, what are you doing? Because I'm not ambitious here anymore. You killed that. See, the cross kills ambition, Amen. and you're raised to serve Him in newness of life. So we're not opportunists. Opportunists are driven by ambition. Well, you'll just sit there and do... No, 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 you won't sit there and do nothing. You'll sit there, and you'll wait to hear the Spirit, and then you'll see God open. That's why Paul said, pray for us for an open door. There could... Paul saw an open door and went, and he said, well, he had to turn around and leave because of an open door. 
He saw it as an opportunity. He didn't call and pray that we have an opportunity because they're all over the place. But open doors, now that makes it God. Pray that God would open a door so that we can go through it. Because there's all kinds of options. We're not ambitious. We don't got to go out there and be somebody. I'm, I don't care about human reputation because God doesn't. That ended. See, there's so much here. Yeah. I mean, we can go on forever. But let's find out number one. And we, This is so 101, it's, it's almost kindergarten. It's ain't even 101. When you look at the cross, you've got to ask yourself two questions. Or forget it. Walk away from it. It's not going to work for you. Is what did he end... What did he end on the cross? Well, he ended my humanity. He ended my lusts. He ended my ambitions. He ended my jealousies. He, everything that that flesh produces is what he ended. Amen. Because Romans 8 says we are no longer debtors to the flesh. Because he ended that. He killed that flesh. He ended it. Made it, no, it has no more jurisdiction over you, no more power over you. So, you got, so when you're in a dilemma, so let's say so you, all of a sudden you have jealousy over somebody. They got the promotion you didn't because you're so ambitious. So you got to go, you, you don't go and fight that guy. You don't get mad at your job. You go to the cross and say, Lord, what did you end? And God says, I ended that jealousy that you're, hit, you're, that you're going through right now. All right, now that's going to pound you. But that's going to be true. He said, I also ended your ambition. You should have never got jealousy in the first place because I ended ambition because that's a work of the, the flesh. So you ask yourself, what did he end? Then the second question is, what did he raise me to? Well, obviously not that job because I didn't get it. So, fine. And I look to what he raises, what he raised me to, which is an inheritance that 1 Peter chapter 1 talks about, that he raised us to and born again to an inheritance. So I'm raised to an inheritance. And that job may not be my inheritance. That woman may not be my inheritance. So I've got to don't get mad, don't get I end, because he ended the fleshly responses to the things I don't get that I'm not supposed to get anyway. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, so where are we at? So we got, we got these outbursts of angers. We got selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness of the like. You know, that those who live a life like this, and this is their way of living, they're not saved people, and they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God is what he ends up saying. So he says, why are you living like the people who don't inherit the kingdom? You've inherited the kingdom. But you've inherited the spirit, so you don't have to be like those people out there. You don't have to be influenced and come under the control of the things that they're coming under the control and influenced by. You know, most of the world, you put a, you dangle a golden carrot in front of them, and everybody sal salivates at the mouth. But Christians shouldn't. Right. You can, you should be, a, a, you should be able to have a million dollars dangled in front of you that compromises your calling or what you're raised to. You should already know, you can't, you can't tempt me with that, because I already know what the cross did for me. And he didn't do what you're trying to get me to do. That ended. So that million dollars you're giving me, I'm not raised to that million. But I may be raised to the ten bucks that's over there offered to me. Big difference, isn't it? How many Christians would go for the million, not the ten? How many would be in a job and the, and the, and the, and the, and the job, the boss comes and says, look, um, we're, we're, we're turning inside out here. Economy's not going. We're, we're re reconstructing everything. And you're not going to have your position anymore because we're going to do away with it. However, we've got a higher position that makes it will give you more money. I don't know if you want to do that. Or we're going to have to put you in the basement in the mail room. One's going to give you more money. One's, one's a demotion. And the other one's a promotion. What did I tell you in the very beginning? Isaiah 11. The Jesus in you is not going to be moved by what he hears and sees. Right. See, you and I will see the promotion, see more money, and then we'll see the demotion and less money. And you'd look at me and say, well, it doesn't take a, a, a genius to figure out what to do. No. Nah. See, what, what is this about figuring out what to do? God never called me to figure out what to do. He called me to hear Him. Amen. And the demotion may be 
where God wants you. But that is so hard to compute because that's not how we were raised for these five senses and the mind, emotions, will to understand. That, that, no, God didn't raise no fool. My mama didn't raise no fool. But God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. So you can't, you got to hear God. That's it. So, what, what did he end and what did he raise you to? So let's go back to the spirit. Now look at verse... Um, 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Look at verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, if you are led by the Spirit, what happens? You're not under law. You're not under law. You don't need a rule book. You don't need somebody to tell you what to do. You don't need these voices. Now, every one of these is a voice telling you what to do that your five senses hears and sees. When you're in a predicament of do I take the promotion, do I take the demotion? When you're in a predicament like that, he says if you walk in the Spirit, you won't have to be told what to do. There's no law telling you take the promotion. You need more money. That, what well, my bank account tells me. Yeah, I know your bank account tells you you need more money, but that's not what God is doing. May not be what he's doing. If I'm walking in the Spirit, I don't need someone to tell me what to do because there is no law. I don't need a list of do's and don'ts. The Spirit is the one opening my eyes and my hearing and renewing my mind and telling me what to do. So let's get back to trying to live one day this way. All right, so, the, so when you're in the Spirit, there is no law. We just said that. So when you wake up in the morning, there is no to-do list. It's what the Spirit inspires you to do. Now, do you think the Spirit is an idiot? Do you think the Spirit knows you have a daily grind? Does the Spirit know you have a job yeah. that you are responsible for? Well, He won't work out with that outside those perimeters. Because God gave Him that job. So the Spirit's going to work within the perimeters of that job however many hours a day. Because you'll look at me and go, well, that's, that's why I say on your day off, try this. Not on your, because the Spirit's going to work in accordance with what He's called you to and what you're involved with. Did, your, did God give you the two kids? Sure, He'll work within the perimeters of those two kids. But there's always going to be, okay, Lord, how do I raise these kids? How do I be a husband? How do I be a wife? How do I be the person I'm at at the job? How do, all that. There's a lot there the Spirit can lead and guide us. And how to be successful in the business He called me to, there's a lot there, and it's called no law. There's no, like with Stevie, he's got his own business. There's no rule book for that. Now, they'll give you rule books for that, but we just said if you walk by the Spirit, there's no law. We just see that as Ten Commandments. It's anything someone's trying to get you to do to bypass hearing Him, what He ended and what He raised you to. And the Spirit is the one to show you what He ended and what He's raising you to. And there is no rule book. Nobody can tell you how to have life. Make sense? Yeah. And I just wonder sometimes, for me personally, how much I am actually walking in the Spirit and not how I was taught. I know how to live life without the Spirit. It's easy. In fact, it's easier to live life without the Spirit because I can do whatever I want. That's right. But when the Spirit's there, you have to be sensitive to what He's doing. So we're going to develop this down the road maybe. It depends on if God's going to allow me to go to do this any further. But this word exercise, we saw that in Hebrews. Those who are mature have exercised their, spirit, their senses. What does that word mean, exercise? In the Greek, the word is gymnasium. So that's where we get the word our gymnasium is from this the word exercise. I can't tell you what the Greek word is, and if I could, I wouldn't be able to pronounce it anyway. But it's gymnasium, so it's exercise. So I am to go into the gymnasium and exercise these five senses. Well, what do you do? Now, this is all from the Greek. You get, you get this, this analogy from the Greek. Is that when someone goes in the gymnasium with a winter coat on and blue jeans on and boots on, they're going to take the winter coat off. They're going to take the blue jeans off. They're going to take the boots off. And they're going to put stuff on that's light so that you can exercise. They're going to, and this is the word, exercise. They're going to strip away something in the gymnasium. That's their clothing. 
they're going to take everything off that hinders them from doing the, the exercise, right? right? That's what Paul's trying to say. We're going to strip everything off what we've been looking at. We're going to strip off how we've learned to hear, how we've learned to take. We're going to strip all the flesh off. You can just put flesh there. And we're going to train these senses, exercise these senses, strip off our culture, our family, our education, what TV, what media, or whatever that other thing was I somehow erased. We're going to strip all that off, and we're going to concentrate on the Spirit, which is walking in the Spirit, and the Spirit's going to take these things, re-revolutionize re the way you think, renew the way you think, and you're, you're going to be stripping off the stuff that's keeping these five senses. I mean, even sight. People get cataracts. Can't see real clear because of the cataracts. You've got to get them taken off. Okay? Hearing. Well, I can't hear no more, so what do i got to put in my ear to hear better? Hearing. So, I mean, there's all kinds of things in the natural. Well, I don't taste. My taste buds aren't like they used to be. All these things, right? Um, maybe you've got nerve endings you don't feel like you used to feel. Or some people can't smell anymore, when they, especially if you've got a cold or something, you can't taste her. So all this stuff has to be worked on in order to fine-tune these, and only the Spirit can do that, which is exercise. You're stripping, the, you're stripping these five senses down to hear the Spirit. And only those who have exercised their senses really only have the right to teach and preach and make disciples from what he said. Because if you're not, you're, you're still on milk. Amen. You're still on milk. So, how many of us wake up on milk? We wake up and we know what to do, the elementary principles of the world. But those of solid food will wake up and go, Lord, what are you doing? Now, I know I've got to go to work. I'm, in fact, those, who are, those that exercise their senses might wake up a little early, get their cup of coffee, and wait on the Lord for about 15 minutes. Or on your way to work, praying in the Spirit. I mean, you, you, this is exercising your senses, fine-tuning them to be sensitive to the Spirit. These are so sensitive to the, these over here. So sensitive. Our five senses are so sensitive to the outward world, the flesh. And the Spirit is sensitive to the Father. Remember that scripture where it says, the Spirit knows the deep things of God? Remember that scripture? Well, let's go there, because you got to see it. You know, nobody's shaking their head, so we're, since you don't know, I'm going to make you know it here. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It works with us anyway. This scripture will work with us anyway. So, I like the progression here. And most preachers never bring this out, but I'm going to go ahead and do it. Look at verse 2. For I determined to know nothing among you except what? Christ... And what? And him crucified. So he's all about the cross. Now what is this cross? Remember what I said. It's going to show you where what God ended and what you're raised to. Right? Now look at verse 9. I has not seen. There you go with the five senses. Your eyes have not seen. Your ears have not heard. Nor have entered into the heart of man, which is the mind. The things which, has, which God has prepared for those who love him through this cross. Okay? But God has revealed them to us. How? His spirit. That's the spirit's job. You need to exercise your mind and your five senses through the spirit. Now watch. The spirit. They're revealed through the spirit. For the spirit does what? Searches all things. So the spirit is going to search your, how, how you see it. Spirit's gonna, that's the Spirit's job, right. is to check your sight, not the guy you go to, the eye doctor. It's the Spirit's job to check your sight. It's the Spirit's job to check your hearing, taste, smell, touch. And it's Spirit's job, what are you thinking? Romans 12 talks about renewing the mind. See, while you're relating to the Spirit, He's searching all things, testing, trying, all these, to get you out of this realm, to put, see, this is the physical realm, this is the spiritual realm. Okay? Let's read on. Searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man? He know, what, for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of that man, which is in him? So no one knows you better than yourself. 
There's deep things about you nobody knows, but you do. Your spirit does. Your spirit man does. Even so, no one knows the things of God except who? So don't come and tell me, oh, I just want to know the deep things of God. I want to hear God. Pray for me. I want to know what job to take. Pray for me. I want to know what woman to marry. Pray for me. I really want to know the deep things of God. I want to know the mysteries. Well, they only come one way. How do they come? Through the Spirit. Through the Spirit. And if we don't go the round, go to the gymnasium of the gymnasium of the Spirit and exercise these senses in our mind, emotions, and will, we're not going to know what squat what God is doing. And I am so convinced more and more, however God shows this to me, for me personally, and how I share it with you, I am so convinced that I would say most Christians do not walk in the Spirit. They're not hearing in the Spirit. They're not seeing in the Spirit. Do you remember that guy? That, and I don't, this, don't know if it's in Kings or whatever, Second Kings. Elijah has that servant. And he's sleeping. The prophet's sleeping. And the servant goes out and goes, Oh my God, look at all those armies. He sees armies coming against them. And he runs back to the prophet and says, you gotta come, you got to come see what I see. So Elijah gets up and he says, look, we're screwed. They've come for you. Remember, because his prophecies and he's, he's hearing things that's going on in the councils of these kings. And he's exposing it to the Israel. And it's almost like he's a spy supernaturally. And they want rid of him because he's exposing all their stuff. So they come to get him. And the, and the servant says, look, we're screwed. And Elijah says, Lord, I don't see what he sees. Wait, what? I don't see what he sees. And Elijah says, Lord, open his eyes to what I see. And God opened his eyes, and what did he see? You know the story. What did he see? Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of angels arrayed against that army. And Elijah could go right back to sleep or whatever they ended up, they ended up doing. So what are we seeing? I'm going to tell you, we're going to see what the world tells us to see. We're going to see what our natural eyes tell us to see. Then you now take that story of Elijah and go to Jesus. And you can, now you know why the, Jesus slept in the boat while the boat is sinking. Water's coming in and he can go to sleep. Their five senses. I see the disciples' five senses. I see the water coming in the boat. I hear the storm and the wind on the sea. I can taste the salt in my mouth. I can smell the ocean, my clothes are now wet, and I can feel the water all around us, and this boat is sinking. You better go wake him up, and this is what they say. Don't you care that we are perishing? But before Jesus got into the boat, you know the story, he heard the Father say, get into the boat and do what? Go to the other side. To the other side. Now that's the Father's will. And the weather can, cannot thwart the purposes and plans of God. Jesus knew that from Daniel chapter 4 where it says nothing can thwart the purposes and plans of God. And if he heard the Father say go to the other side, he could get in that boat, know that there's a storm coming, and still go to sleep while the water's around his head. He's getting wet too. And stay there in perfect rest. And that's what sleep speaks of. While everybody else is freaking out because their five senses are screaming something's wrong. And their mind kicks in and they're going to perish. Their emotions, they're mad at Jesus and they go down there and they give him what for? And what does he say? You people of unbelief. Why? Because you're so wrapped up in that world. Your five... Jesus said it. Isaiah prophesied it. And this is what blew the minds of these people. He's not, going to, he's not going to judge by what he sees. Yes, there's a storm. But I heard, I heard God. Now, if he didn't hear God, then he would be responsible not to get into the storm. I mean, there are certain things that God did give you the ability to understand. You know, you don't drive your car on four flat tires. 
unless God tells you to. I mean, are you willing for God to tell you some crazy things that make no sense at all? How, 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 you, and so my, God's already doing, has been doing that, not all the time, but I'm thinking, man, that's, we were at a service, and a guy used to go to church here, his wife said, you need to pray for my husband, he's really just, she just kept saying he's dry, he's just, he's lost his um, zeal for life, and, and um, so forth and so on, and Diane, you may have been there, so, um, but anyway, I'm just praying for him, and you know what the Lord tells me to do? Do a rain dance around him, because I'm going to pour the rain of this. I'm like, I'm not going to do a rain dance. I have never done a rain dance. I'm not going to do, I didn't do a rain dance as a kid, and I definitely ain't going to do one as a grown adult. What is a rain dance? I don't know. Never done one. And this guy's just got this cold stone look on his face, and he's just, and God says, do a rain dance. I'm like, oh my Lord, here we go. So the only rain dances I've seen is on these cowboy <laughs> movies. And I just start going woo, 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 around him. And I'm telling you, he starts laughing. The spirited laugh came on him, tears coming down. Now that, I mean, in a split second, I'm looking at a guy. My prayers aren't moving him. I'm praying. I'm believing. He's just been there, done that. I don't know. And God says, do the rain dance. And I'll break that over him. That was embarrassing for me to do. I was in another meeting. God says, I want to, and we were on Meg's Avenue. I don't even remember that. Or this, and he said, um, this guy was praying, you know, I really want to hear God. I want my mind renewed and all this. And he's praying and I'm, and I'm praying. And God says, get your Bible and lay it on his head. I'm not going to get my Bible and lay it on his head. Come on. I know that's not going to... It's not about... It's like God. It's like Jesus hearing God say, spit in the mud, stick in that guy's eyes. Now, there is no medicinal stuff in spit or right. mud. But Jesus said, okay, if that's what you tell me to do, I'm going to do it. Are, are we willing to buy... And I, I'm telling you, why would God do that? Because our five senses are so in tune. I'm not doing that, God. <coughs> And he wants to break that hold that the, the soul, because all this is really the soul. The mind, all this comes from the soul, which is the, you know, the flesh. And it has such a hold on us, we can't hear the spirit. So God, what was, when God told me to put that Bible on that guy's head, and God told me to do the rain dance, what was he doing? He was exercising my senses to hear the spirit. Break the hold that my mind, you don't do that. You're, you'll embarrass yourself. That will look stupid. Remember David's wife who really tore him up because he was out there dancing like a crazy guy in front of the ark when it was bring, being brought back in? He was dancing and he was half naked because he was in the, he had his he had his outer clothes on, but he had his inner clothes on. They called that nakedness in the Bible. And he's just dancing before the Lord and had a parade and party. And when he gets to the to the um, to his, his castle, his wife's upstairs, Micah, which is Saul's daughter, and she says, what a fool you were today. You embarrassed me. He says, well, if that embarrassed you, you ain't seen nothing yet. I'm not going to let you dictate to me, try to put me back in order when the Spirit's trying to get me out of order and into Him. That's, that's, there's, that, there's a lot there Amen. to meditate on. So, when you, so what I'm saying is, listen, I know what it's like because it happened to me. You wake up in the morning and right away, you got a lot to do. You got a lot going on. Your mind starts kicking in, going 90 miles an hour. And these all kick in, your mind, everything. And the spirit is over there being resisted because you're not even giving him at the time of day. Because you know how to live this life. You know what you need to do. Oh, I'll, I'll use him when I'm in trouble. Car breaks down. Oh, Jesus! Well, where was old Jesus in the morning when you were drinking your coffee? This is hypocrisy. This is, this is the Santa Claus mentality. I only use him when I need him. No. You are to walk in the Spirit 24-7. Not when you need a 911. And I want to close with this one now. Because this one you relate to. Remember I told you, and this happens a lot. And, and I got this this morning, so I know it's from God. 
Remember I told you that I cannot figure this out. And I think I got I got to figure it out a little bit. I'll go to bed, say on a Saturday night, and I'm going over my notes. And I'm like, God, I wish I was in church right now. Man, the anointing's on me. Spirit of God's on me. If I can get these people to come over to my house, we, I, I'm ready. But church ain't till tomorrow. So I go to bed and I can't sleep because I, I, I mean, God's all over this thing. And I can't wait to share it with you, right? I finally go to sleep. And in six hours, because that's about all I get. Six hours, I wake up. And there is no life on me. There's no anointing on me. Remember what I told you. I know it's rude and crude, but, but honestly, I have to be this way to let you know how empty I feel sometimes when I wake up. I woke. I, I would go to bed with the anointing, the power of God, ready. I mean, just give me something, but somebody to talk to, lay hands on. So, I mean, God's here. I go to bed. Six hours later, I wake up and I feel like I slept walk. In Clarksburg, where I had something with a prostitute, I bought drugs off of somebody, I got drunk, and did every evil thing you can possibly think of, and then went back to sleep and woke up like I had just done all those things. That's, and I know that sounds crazy, but when the Spirit of God is off of you, and you don't feel that anymore, it's a contrast. And I'm thinking, so my thing was, God, what happens in six hours? I didn't think a bad thought. I didn't sin. I just slept. How in the world? If I had the spirit on me going to sleep, I should have the spirit on me waking up. And that rarely happens. And I hate it when it happens from a Saturday night to a Sunday morning. And that's what happened to me this morning. I got up, got my coffee, sat down, and I'm like, oh my God, I've got nothing on me. There, where are you? I looked at my notes this morning. I'm like, you got, is this not the sermon? Because I ain't getting nothing off of this like I did last night. I thought I had the sermon. What are you, what, what, what are you doing? And I'm like, here we go again. I felt so empty, right? Went to bed full. Went to bed full, woke up empty in six hours. How does that happen? Does anybody know how that happens? Has is, is, is that ever happened to anybody, or is that just God doing that to me? No, it happens. Okay, it happens, right? Yeah. yeah. So why? So I'm sitting there, and now I'm wallowing in my whatever it is, I'm, my emptiness. I'm like, great. So I'm sitting there in the, in the spirit, because I'm turning to the spirit. I didn't turn to the TV. Well, let's just see what's on. I turn to the spirit, start talking to God. And within minutes, he gives me this scripture. John 15, I think it's 3 verse 5 or something like 3 through 5. Without me, you can do nothing. So I'm like, okay. Talk to me about that. You know, okay, well, so I'm starting meditating on that, and it starts hitting me, okay. Now, here's what you got to understand, and I'm done, because I, I, it's not really even a message. I'm just throwing stuff at you today. But um, remember how we do the body, soul, and spirit, right? Spirit, soul, body. When you understand the distinction, and believe me, there's a distinction, because 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says that God would sanctify you holy, spirit, soul, and body. So we're made up of three parts. However, they're meshed together. And they're supposed to be meshed together. Because Adam was perfectly meshed together. What his spirit, what him and the Father decided to do, his soul, his mind, emotions, will, his five senses followed suit. There was no, there was no friction between flesh and spirit with Adam. Okay? Till the fall. Then there's a friction between there. Because the spirit died at the fall. And now he's just a soul man, soulish. He's operating out of his five senses and the mind, emotions, and will. And these are all fallen now. And we're born into fallenness because until Christ through the cross, we get born again. And now the soul has to learn how to operate with the spirit. And that's what he, in Hebrews 4 says, the word of God sharper than any two-edged sword divides <coughs> soul from spirit. Mainly saying it divides what's God and what's not God. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, so um, I lost my train of thought. What was I, what was I saying? See, that's the mind. 
Okay, what, what was I saying? I said, I want, to, I want to end with this. What was it? About the soul, the three. Um, while I'm thinking, go to Hebrews, Hebrews 5. I want to end with Hebrews 5. I definitely want to end with Hebrews 5. I was going somewhere with this. Hebrews 5. He's saying how God showed you that verse. Yes, yes. John 15. So, apart from him, thank you. See, this is where you guys got to help me. You're not, you're not a spectator. You got to help me in this. Honestly. And I'm just sidebar that. This is a, this is a little church life lesson. If you're, ta if, you're, if you're tracking with me and you're writing these notes down or take... Then when I'm like, what was I talking about? Because I get on these little sidebars, and you can say, like you just did, John 15, it was like, oh, got it. So help me. Work with me on this. <laughs> You're not a spectator. We're in this thing together, okay? So John 15, he said, apart from me, you can do nothing. So um, I'm thinking, okay, I get that. And then it hits me. I understand that my spirit and my soul... That six hours that I went to sleep, the spirit just rested. And then you've got the soul that wakes up in the morning and looks at the clock. <clears throat> Spirit's not looking at the clock. You're looking at the clock. You're looking at the to-do list. And the spirit says, okay, you're going to come to me and we'll, I'll work with you on what you need to do. I'll anoint you for the task. I'll give you wisdom, knowledge, and understanding for every decision you have to make out there. Let me walk, walk in me as you do these things. But we don't do that, so we're automatically get out of the house, take a shower, get out, and we're in the soul. We never gave time. We never cultivated that which went to sleep. The soul went to sleep, and the spirit goes to sleep. And the body rests, because God has us sleeping, right? All right. So when you wake up, you've got to cultivate that spirit. That's your job, to wake up and walk in the spirit. You wake up, and I know Benny Hinn had a book, and uh, nobody likes Benny Hinn anymore, but he did have a good book at one time in the early 90s called Good Morning, Holy Spirit. And the, book, the premise of that book was to say, wake up and turn to the spirit. Don't rest in your soul. That's what everybody does. That's what the Gentiles do. That's what the lost does. You, however are not like the Gentiles. You need to wake up and turn to the Spirit and walk out your life, your day, with the Holy Spirit that's been sent to you from above. Why else do you have Him? But to walk in Him. You live in Him, meaning this. He's in you. Remember I said I had that hard time understanding that verse? If you live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. I said, what's the difference between living in the Spirit and walking in the Spirit? Remember that verse we looked at? Living in the Spirit means this. You are alive in the Spirit. You're born of the Spirit. Now walk in it, which means you've got to turn to Him. That's faith. You've got to turn to Him. And then He says, okay, and that's it. He just wants you to turn. Remember 2 Corinthians 3. Those who turn to the Lord, the veil gets ripped. You've got to turn. For the veil to get removed. You can't, every day you've got to turn to the Spirit. And you may turn to the Spirit at 7 o'clock in the morning, and by 11, you're so caught up in, remember we talked about people vomiting their crap on you, yeah. lying to you, yelling at you, and you getting, uh, hitting a pothole and getting upset. And all of a sudden, the flesh starts rearing, and you got to go, oh, turn to the Spirit. How, you have to turn to the Spirit every time you sense the flesh. Well, how often? Every time you sense the flesh rearing its ugly head, you turn to the Spirit. Every 10 minutes. Exactly, yeah. Because honestly, everything, I, I don't know, maybe I'm hanging around him too much, but everything just starts potholes to people and every. <laughs> I'm like, man, God, what's going on? And, you know, we, we all have those short fuses or those our, our, our patience are, is thin. But, again, when you sense that coming on you, and God knows, you, you know what it is. You know what the flesh is. You have to turn to the Spirit. Your kids do something to make you mad. Your husband makes you mad. Don't engage the anger. That's the sign you're in the flesh. 
Stop and say, whoa, boy, I wish I would have learned this in my early years, especially being married. You know, you get mad and you just want to throw that anger on your wife or your husband. How about saying, okay, I know that's the flesh because that is not the fruit of the Spirit. So I don't need a rule book. I know what's the flesh. I know what's the Spirit. And if I don't, believe you me, the Spirit will tell you. He'll divide soul from spirit. But anyway, you, you, you stop and say, Lord, you turn to the spirit and you wait on him. You rest in him. And if you don't get to talk to your husband or wife for five, ten minutes, just, I'm telling you, that's being a responsible Christian who walks in the spirit. He's not going to jump in the flow of the flesh. He's going to stop that and turn to the spirit and get influenced by the spirit and come under the control of the spirit in every situation and circumstance. Even, even to the waking up in the morning saying, Lord, what are we doing? I know i got to go to work. What are you doing today? What is it? What? How come we take, take every single day as if it's just going to be a mediocre day? What if every day there's one thing the Spirit has designed for you to accomplish? But we didn't turn to Him, and we stayed in the flesh and missed an opportunity. And there's going to be, and I, we all miss opportunities. But if we're walking in the Spirit, you're not going to miss nothing. You're not going to miss anything because the Spirit will be there to tell you. Now, let me close with five, chapter five, that verse again, that last verse. But solid food, and that's what this is all solid food. This is not milk. Milk is rules and regulations and to-do lists and flesh and self. Solid food is walking in the Spirit, trusting the grace of God and the cross. But what's what he say here? Solid food belongs to those who are full age, that's maturity, and are not drinking milk anymore. That is, those who by reason of use exercise their senses. Now here's what I want you to see. To discern both good and evil. Anybody have a problem discerning good and evil? Okay, let's try it. Giving to the poor. What's that fall under? Good. Good. Having sex with a woman outside of marriage, what's that fall under? That's evil. That's evil. So you know what the difference is. Right? Good and evil. That is not what that verse is saying. And I've got, I know that I've gotten criticized. It doesn't take a genius to figure it out. I've gotten criticized when I make this statement. I no longer live by right and wrong, good and evil. Because that's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So when I, I don't say, God, oh, that's wrong, I'm not going to do it. I know that. That's just, that's just, that's, that's second nature. I, that's just, that's, that's easy stuff. This is wrong. This is good. But I don't live by that. Because that will take the place of the Spirit. When my senses are exercised, the way that I've been trying to show you, you will get to the place of discerning not good and evil. That's, that, that's right. That's a right translation. But you have to understand what Paul means when he says good and evil. And it's not what you think it is. And this is the problem. This is the disconnect the church has with the Holy Spirit. And what Paul is saying here is, I, by, desert, by exercising my senses, like Jesus, I'm only going to, I'm going to see what the Father sees. I'm going to hear what the Father hears, not what I physically hear and see. And the rest. I'm going to exercise these senses. That makes me, that makes me solid food. That makes me mature. And I've exercised my senses to be able to discern... What is God and what is not? That's all that means. That's not going back to the law. That's not do, do this, don't do that. That's good, that's bad. No, 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 no. By resting in the Spirit, He opens my eyes and ears and the rest of my life, the rest of my stuff, to what is God and what is not God. And a promotion may not be God. That's it. More money may not. We, we Remember, we can I talk about how we tried to expand your business? Yeah. And it was on, on paper, he had more customers, he needed to hire somebody, make more. And you too, you should, because you had the same thing with your landscaping business. Hire more, and did it work for you guys to expand your, both of you are in the same boat. Did it work to expand those businesses? Pay, pay the price, Lord. So they, I don't know what you did, but he basically ended up going back to where he was, because that didn't work. And I was there with you. Yeah, do it, do it. Because we were, we were, our, our senses, we're getting our, we got our education from what the world says do. We were discerning good and evil through our own eyes, through what we've been taught. But God says when you're in the Spirit, you will discern what the Spirit is doing 
which is what's God and what's not God. You can't even say this if it's good, it's God. Oh, no. Because that was a good thing you did. Yeah. You even hired somebody. Yeah. Good for him. Yeah. Wasn't you. Good is not always God. It was good to hire those guys. But that's not always good. It's not God. And if you want to just eat from a tree of knowledge, good and evil, that's where you'll make every mistake, produce every Ishmael, and never get in where God, into what God is doing. You'll never get to what God's raised you to by having your senses exercised by the world. You will only get what God's raised you to by having your senses exercised by the Spirit. And then you'll discern what's God and what's not God. How many times did Jesus, the disciples, here's a classic when I'll be done. Jesus' own brother said, hey, it's the feast. Go up there and show yourself. Do some miracles up there. It, 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 the feast meant this. Every Jew was in town. So every, he says, this is the time that you'll have the biggest crowd you'll ever be. Go. It's the time of the feast. You know what Jesus said to them? Your time is always now. Because it made sense to you to go up because it's, uh, it's more people than ever is in Jerusalem during these feasts. And Jesus says, I'm not going to go. Because you say for me to go, it makes sense to go. What's it? He, he's exercising, he has exercised his, his senses through the Spirit to discern what's God and what's not God. He didn't discern God saying, show yourself to the crowd. However, he went, but he didn't show himself to the crowd. He was in the background. But he didn't do it the way they want. Peter says, you're not going to go to the cross. What was Peter doing? He was discerning good and evil. Why? Going to the cross is evil. Can't be good. How many things has God put you in that was good and you, through your false discernments, saw it as bad? And here's a classic example. They get, the children of Israel gets out of Egypt. Out of Egypt to go to the promised land. Now in between Egypt and the promised land is the wilderness. And as soon as they get out of Egypt, the Bible says... God led them, or it might say the Spirit, led them to the waters of Mirabah. How many remember the waters of Mirabah? They all get to the waters of Mirabah, and they all take their cups, dip it in the water, and they drink it. And rather than swallow, they spit it out, and they murmur and complain to God about the waters of Mirabah, which means bitter waters. The water that they drank was bitter. Now, do you think God knew... That water was bitter. You think God's like, oh, man, I didn't know that. Now let's go somewhere else and get you some fresh water. Sorry, guys, my bad. It was ordained. Their senses of taste spit that water out because they weren't discerning what the Spirit was doing. They was discerning taste by what they've learned and educated by what they wants and desires and all that. So what was in the waters of Mirabah? You've got to understand, he was preparing them for manna. He was preparing them for his food. He had to wean them off of Egyptian food. And in those waters, and you can go to those waters and they've done it. This is archaeologically proven. In those waters are high levels of chemicals, especially calcium and potassium. <coughs> really high. And when you drink that, you get diarrhea. And that was God trying to get the bacteria and all the crap that they got in Egypt out of their system. He was cleansing their system for heavenly manna. And they didn't know it, but they wouldn't trust God. And what I'm saying is how many times has God put you in a situation that you discerned yeah. bad, right. and it can't be God because, oh, no, no, it's God. Just trust Him. It's God. He's doing something you don't know because you, you've never discerned from the Spirit the five senses has never been exercised by the Spirit to discern what's, what's God, what's not God. So you just go by, well, that's evil. That's good. That's God. That's not God. That's bad. That's good. And how many times have you gotten mad at God? Because something didn't happen. You wanted to happen. But because you're discerning what... You're taking your cues from over here rather than from over here. And then you got to go to the cross and say, well, obviously that's not what he's doing. He's, he's ended that. And he's raised me to something else. And I'm telling you, this all this is not something that can be taught. Though I'm telling you about it. I can't teach you this. This is not something that can be taught. It has to be caught. Meaning this, you got to live this out. Amen. No rule book for this. 
There's no law for this because it specifically says when you're in the Spirit, you're not under law. I can't give you guidelines and principles and keys. That doesn't work. The Spirit is something you have to work on in the sense of um, start doing it. And you learn what works, what doesn't work, but it's on-the-job training. That's what this is. This is on-the-job training. You'll be able to start discerning what's God and what's not as you function in the Spirit. You'll learn. You'll grow. That's why he said full maturity, solid food. People that have done this and are well on into it are the ones that are on solid food. Those on milk, have, they, don't, they, they don't know anything about this. But they're Christian and they're saved, but they're ruled by the senses and mind that's been dictated to them by the world, the flesh, and the devil. So, you do with that what you want. There's a lot more to be said, but maybe we'll continue this next week. We'll see. And um, let's just ask the Holy Spirit to um, make this a reality, because this is all scriptural. I didn't tell you anything that wasn't scriptural. So this is not my take on it. I mean, I, I don't think I said anything that wasn't scriptural. So let's all agree together that even me, I'm not there. I'm like Paul, not that I've arrived, but I press on to reach forward to this that lies ahead. I mean, I'm, I may not be there, but I'm on my way there. Amen. Okay, so even if you're not there, let's all get on the journey to be there. Let's all at least get on the path that's going to take us there. At least we are pointed in the right direction if we're not completely there. Heavenly Father, there's no judgment here today or condemnation. This is, this is not something that I can browbeat anybody over the head with because it's not something that's taught. This is something that the Spirit does within us, leads us and guides us into all truth, strips our, strips our five senses of all the worldliness, strips our mind of worldliness. So our, we take our cues from the Holy Spirit we, we're, we live in the Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. So let's not, why not walk in Him? Everybody here has the Holy Spirit. So let's walk in Him. He's there. He's there to walk in. It's that simple. Just turn to Him. He'll start working. That's His job. It's not your job to work the Spirit. The Spirit's job is to work Himself in you. But you've got to turn to Him. Which means you, you, when you turn to Him, you're, you're denying yourself. And that's what the cross is all about. To deny self and trust the Spirit to work. There is nothing in you. Self is what make, wakes you up in the morning empty. The self-life is what's being apart from him. John 15, 5, apart from him you can do nothing. That means in your own self, you're empty. And you've got to run and get filled. That's what Ephesians says. Be being filled is the, is the Greek. Not just be filled once. It's be being filled. Every day we get filled. We get filled. And out of our belly will flow what? Rivers of living water. So, Lord, open our eyes to this. This is, this is strong food. This is solid food. This is not milk. This is nothing. This is so far from milk. I want to be able to discern in my life what's God and what's not. And I have that ability in the Spirit. As I turn to Him, Every day, every hour, and every minute. But the minute I trust self is where I will make my wrong choice. Because self made that choice, not the Spirit. Education made that choice, not revelation. So open our eyes this morning, I pray. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.